I had been searching, trying to understand why some countries were healthier and some countries were less healthy. I went back to public health school with this quest. Uh, and that's where I first came across the studies uh, in just a paper that I downloaded. Well, I didn't download it in those days. You went to the copier and, uh, and produced it that way. Uh, then we uh, actually got to spend a month in Nepal together in the late 1990s. And uh, then uh, I came to know Kate through her connection of, with Richard because she wanted to uh, understand uh, who was Richard, who was researching all of these ideas. So I've been really privileged in spending time with them. Richard represents somebody who uh, today would be one of these marginalized people. That is, he's an, a, a, an emeritus professor of social epidemiology, but doesn't have a PhD. And that's, I think, part of the reason why he he can look so broadly at things that are not so narrowly defined. Kate Pickett comes with uh, a long stay in the United States. She's originally uh, from England, and, uh, and she has a, uh, she's a champion, that's what her title is, at the University of York. And I learned last night, you know, she, she doesn't have to teach. She gets lots of grant money. She uh, awards honorary degrees and things like that. So. Uh, I think we really learned a lot uh, about these people. So our plan is to have them present on the ideas in the book, The Spirit Level, which has been the textbook for my courses since it first appeared in 2010 in the United States. And now their new book, The Inner Level, uh, sort of expands on a lot of the ideas uh, that they'll present tonight. So I'm hoping that they can talk until about 8 o'clock. We've invited four panelists to come up at that time, and I've asked each of them to address a question that is kind of relevant to Kate and, Pick's, uh, Kate and Richard's presentation. Uh, but I, obviously, they're, they're free to talk about other things, too. So uh, I'll introduce the panelists after, uh, after Richard and Kate's talk. So please join me in welcoming Richard and Kate. Well, it's lovely to be back in Seattle. We were here almost 10 years ago um, talking about our, our previous book, and it's great to, to be back here. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm going to start, um, and then um, Richard will take over and then you get a tiny bit of me again at the very end. And what we want to talk to you about tonight is really the psychological effects of inequality. And share with you our thinking as it's developed over the last decade um, and much of the new research that has been done by, by other people around the world as well as us. And what we're really trying, <coughs> I think, to overcome is a naive view of inequality. And the naive view of inequality is that it only matters if it's linked to poverty, you know, high rates of poverty, or if it's really extreme and very unfair. But actually, a more accurate view of inequality is that it brings out features of our evolved psychology that are to do with dominance and subordination, superiority and inferiority. And inequality affects how we treat each other, how we feel about ourselves. It increases status competition and anxieties about status. Um, it increases our anxieties about our self-worth. It intensifies worries about how we're seen and judged. So that's a more accurate view, and we want to share with you how, we, how we've come to that understanding. Um, and we're also, as public health academics, really concerned about the epidemic of mental ill health and distress that we're seeing in our very unequal societies today. And so we're trying to understand why it is that when, when we, we're expected to look like this, to present ourselves to the world as shiny, happy people, in fact, in the real world, we look 
more like this. Okay, so this first photo, these shiny happy people, it's actually an advertisement for a psychotherapy clinic um, <laughs> in California. So they're not shiny happy people. They might actually be actors um, or models, but they're certainly, they're looking like we think we ought to look. You know, we curate our self-image these days and we feel that we should be pursuing happiness and well-being, that we're responsible for our own well-being um, and that we should all look like this. And then here's the reality. These are young people um, outside Oxford Street tube station in London. So they're all employed. Um, they're going to work. They are uniformly miserable. <laughs> There's not a smile among them. Some of them look as if they're about to burst into tears. Some of them look really angry. None of them are speaking to each other. Um, even when they're on the phone, they, they don't look as if they're having a happy communication. And if you'd gone back um, a few generations and asked our grandparents and great-grandparents, what do you think life would be like when, when you know, you're living with the material levels of comfort that we all have, they would have expected that we would look like this and they would be really curious as to why we actually seem to be so miserable. Um, if we look at some of the statistics for mental health in the, in the United States today, um, one poll shows, one survey shows that 79% of Americans feel stressed sometime each day. But more worrying is that almost 60% say they are paralyzed by stress. So we're not talking just a little bit of stress that maybe gets you going and makes you work a little bit harder. We're talking about people feeling paralyzed by stress. One fifth of you have a mental illness meeting diagnostic criteria at any given time. One fifth. And more than half of your young people have been diagnosed with some kind of mental health issue. Now, the data for the UK are so similar. So about three quarters of us feel so stressed at some point in the previous year that we felt overwhelmed and unable to cope. And a third of British people in one survey reported having had suicidal thoughts. Our young people's levels of mental illness are just, just like yours, and we have a horrendous epidemic of self-harm. So in our societies, we've got levels of distress levels of mental dis-ease that really need understanding. And what we're doing really in our new book, The Inner Level, is trying to understand how inequality shapes our experience of life and our mental health and well-being, and how that is the link between inequality and a whole range of health and social outcomes that we've known about for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. So we wrote The Spirit Level, our previous book, which was published here in 2010, so almost a decade ago. And it was an attempt to make the research on income inequality and health and social problems better known. So Richard had been working as an academic in the field for a long time. So had I. He'd been working a lot longer than I had. Um, and we had written a lot about this together and separately, and nobody, nobody reads it, right? Nobody reads academic research papers. I'm really sorry to academics in the audience. You know, we all do it. We write them, we publish them, and nobody reads them, right? Our students don't read them. Our parents don't read them. Nobody reads them. If you want people to know about that kind of research, you have to communicate it in a different way. So we decided to write a book and try and get the evidence better known so that the public could access it, politicians and policymakers. But when you try and present statistics and epidemiological research to a general public, you have to be really careful how you do it. So we knew that publishers say, if you put an equation in a book, you lose 10,000 readers. <laughs> <clears throat> Stephen Hawking was told that when he was writing A Brief History of Time. He put one in anyway, E equals MC squared, and I think he got away with it. 
But we took this seriously and we didn't put any equations in our book. We used very simple graphs and charts, but nevertheless, we were trying to communicate statistical evidence um, to a lot of people. And I think, you know, I think we did a reasonable job of making our charts and graphs simple, but not as good as this one. And we found this one. <laughs> we found this one on Google. <coughs> Richard found this on Google. And he says, it summarizes 45 years of hard intellectual <laughs> labor. Yeah? So if you can understand this chart, you can understand everything we have to tell you tonight. Right? As income inequality increases, so do problems. All right, let's look at a slightly more complicated one. This is our index of health and social problems in relation to income inequality. And the index of <coughs> health and social problems that we created includes measures of population health, like life expectancy, infant mortality, obesity, and mental illness, but also things to do with children's life chances, um, how well kids do in school, teenage pregnancy rates, social mobility. And then things to do with social relationships, so levels of trust and violence um, and imprisonment. And we put all of those together into one index, and then we look at different rich developed countries um, and relate their performance on that index of health and social problems to income inequality. Countries low down have low levels of health and social problems, Countries at the top have high levels of problems. The more equal countries are over here on the left. The more unequal ones are over there on the right. <clears throat> so we have Japan, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, the Scandinavian countries, and Japan with low levels of inequality and high health and good social outcomes. UK, Portugal, USA, more unequal, <laughs> more health and social problems. And we just see this pattern again and again. We did the same thing for the 50 US states, and we find exactly the same pattern. The more equal states have fewer health and social problems, the more unequal states have more. So we know it's not just something to do with the different countries we're looking at. It's a pattern we can see across the 50 states. And we also see it if we look at somebody else's index of well-being. Um, if we look at the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing, we find the same phenomenon. So UNICEF produced this every few years. It's a measure of child well-being in rich countries. It contains everything from whether kids eat their fruits and vegetables, whether they're immunized, if they have books in the home, if they can talk to their parents, etc. In the more equal societies, again, we've got Norway, Sweden, Japan, Finland, the Netherlands up here, high levels of child well-being going along with low um, inequality and low levels of child well-being in the more unequal countries. So a very consistent picture. And really the message of the spirit level was that a wide range of health and social problems are related to inequality. The effects are large and so large that we realize that we're all affected by inequality. I want to show you just one or two of those individual sorts of factors. This is looking at prisoners. So we're looking at imprisonment here in different rich countries, prisoners per 100,000. Now, this is a very odd scale here. Um, the distance between 10 and 100 here is the same as between 100 and 1,000, a log scale, and we fitted the data on this scale so that we can put the USA on here, okay? So we have about 50, 50 prisoners per 100,000 people in the more equal societies and 680 something in the USA. And you see the UK up there as well. So very large differences between different countries. Since we um, did our work, there's been an absolute explosion of research on the impact of inequality. In particular, I think among psychologists, social psychologists, really looking at the psychological consequences of inequality. We wish that we could find a measure of bullying among adults in different societies 
There is no measure of that, but there is for children. So these data come from a colleague of ours in Canada, um, Frank Elgar, um, and he and his colleagues look at 37 different countries. They look at a measure of bullying, how, what percentage of 11-year-olds report that they bully other children, and we see around 5% of kids admitting to bullying others, or less than 5% in the more equal countries, and more like a fifth of children in the more unequal ones. And the last, the last of these charts that I want to show you, just looking at single factors, is looking at social mobility. So the ability of children to move up and down in society, irrespective of their parents' social class. And in your country and in ours, politicians across the political spectrum will agree that we should have equality of opportunity. Children should have equal life chances. But it turns out you cannot have that equality of opportunity in places where you have great inequality of outcome. And so we see social mobility higher in the more equal countries and lower in the more unequal ones. Here's the United States. I'm afraid we do often say that if you want the land of opportunity and to live the American dream, then you're more likely to be able to do that in Denmark. <laughs> we knew our work would be controversial. It did come under some criticism. In particular, what we heard most often was that what we were showing people were simply correlations between inequality and some kind of outcome, and we were not proving causation. Now, if I had a dollar for every time somebody had said to me that correlation doesn't prove causality in the past decade, I'd be in the top 1%, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't need to be traveling around trying to, I don't know, sell a book or something. Um, <laughs> But in fact, we're convinced that this is a causal relationship. We've published um, a review, a causal review, of the evidence within an epidemiological framework. Um, but there are hundreds of papers on inequality in health now, hundreds of papers on inequality in crime, and also an increasing number of papers that show us that when inequality changes, outcomes change. Um, these data come from an analysis that we published in 2015, looking at changes in that UNICEF index of child well-being I mentioned earlier. And we looked at changes in that over a decade and changes in income inequality over a decade. And the countries that became a little bit more equal over the decade saw their child well-being improve. Not a lot, and sometimes it's improving from a low base, but they saw their child well-being improve. Whereas the countries that became a little bit more unequal over that decade saw their child well-being decline. So here we have Sweden has the fastest growing inequality among the OECD countries and it's seen its child well-being decline over that time period exactly as we would predict. It doesn't seem to matter which measure of inequality you look at. Um, Richard and I have tended to prefer to use the gap between the incomes of the top fifth of the population and the bottom fifth, how much richer are the top 20% compared to the bottom 20%, because that's quite easy to understand. Um, and if we look at that measure in the more equal countries, the top fifth of the population have incomes about three and a half to four times those of people at the bottom in the more unequal societies, UK, Portugal, USA, Singapore, seven to 10 times. But there are other measures of inequality that economists have developed. There's one called the Gini Index, you know, which isn't to do with genies and bottles. It's just a measure of inequality. There's the Robin Hood Index, which is to do with taking from the rich and giving to the poor and that kind of thing. But anyway, it doesn't seem to matter which you use. You get the same relationships. Just before Christmas, I was reading um, Michelle Obama's memoir. And um, at one point, just after she and Barack Obama have got married, and she's still feeling like she's getting to know him, um, she says to him one night in bed, what are you thinking about, honey? 
And he says income inequality. Yeah? Well, for the last 15 years, I could have asked that question any night and got the same answer. Um, and, you know, Richard has been thinking about income inequality pretty consistently and for a lot longer than 15 years. So I'm going to turn over to him now and he'll share with you more, more of our thoughts. Okay, good, thank you. Um, I want to say something about the processes that lie behind the data that Kate's been uh, showing. And uh, <coughs> the first thing I want to say is that um, People look at all these different problems, and there are many more than Kate showed you. I mean, she could have, could have shown you that teenage births are worse in more unequal societies, and um, obesity is worse, uh, a whole range of other things. What they all have in common that explains why they are related to inequality is that they all have social gradients. They're all more common at the bottom of the social ladder. So although there's ill health and violence at the top, they're more common at the bottom. Um, and it's very specifically problems with social gradients that get worse with more inequality. So in a sense, we're saying something extraordinarily simple. The problems which we know are sensitive to social gradients, to social position, to social differentiation, get worse when we increase the social status differences between us. And really, we should have known that and recognized it for, I don't know, the last 30 years or so. I think the most surprising thing about our spirit level book is that people, that it, that it said anything anyone didn't know already. I think it's bizarre we hadn't seen these patterns and recognized them. Related to that, uh, one important point that Kate touched on is that the differences in performance of rich and uh, more and less equal societies are very large indeed. And that is, as she said, because it's not just the poor who are affected. The impact of inequality goes all the way up to society. The biggest effects are on the poor, uh, but even nearer the top of society, people with good jobs, good education and incomes and so on, uh, they would be likely to live a little bit longer if they lived in a more equal society. Their children might do a little bit better at school. They'd be less likely to become victims of violence. In those sorts of ways, uh, even well-off people would, become, um, would do better in more equal societies. The other thing I want to say, coming out of that, um, is that this is not something different from class and status. You all have probably always known what part of Seattle health was worst in. Worst in the poorest areas. Violence is worst in those areas. The educational performance of school kids is worst in those areas. So this is, income distribution is not something different from class and status. I think what we're talking about is whether our societies have a very steep social pyramid like that or a much shallower one like that. Um, so think of it in a way as provide the, the material differences between us providing the sort of scaffolding on which all the cultural markers of, of status uh, are attached. And that one of the real keys to the effects of inequality is again, as Kate said in the beginning, uh, that inequality makes class and status more important. In a sense, inequality is a social relationship. It's not about how many goods I've got compared to how many goods you've got. It's about issues to do with superiority and inferiority, dominance and subordination. My goods are important in terms of how they display me in relation to other people. You know, you, you gauge our success. We judge each other's uh, internal worth, as it were, from external wealth, from issues to do with, with wealth and social position. So think of it as inequality as making those kinds of uh, uh, links 
more powerful. And it's not simply that all the problems with uh, social gradients get worse. You can also see in a more unequal society that people are less, less, marry, less likely to marry someone from a different social class. Uh, there's more residential segregation between rich and poor. Um, there is less social mobility, as Kate showed you in one of the last slides. So in all those ways, you can see the effects of inequality as sort of ossifying the social structure and making it a more powerful determinant uh, of people's lives. We know people are particularly sensitive to these issues of social status. There have been a lot, there's been a lot of experimental work trying to find out what pushes up people's levels of stress hormones most easily. And in reviewing over 200 uh, laboratory experiments, you know, where students are invited in to um, take part in, in some psychological experiment, they found that uh, what we are most sensitive to what pushes up our levels of cortisol, a central stress hormone most reliably, are tasks which they say include social evaluative threat. <coughs> Threats to self-esteem or social status where others can judge you negatively. You know, we find public speaking stressful because we're worried about making fools of ourselves in front of other people. You know, all those issues to do with embarrassment and uh, feeling you're looked down on and so on. That's all part of this picture. I want to emphasize that this really isn't simply about the direct effects of living in better or worse material conditions. The material conditions, as I said, are about placing you in relation to others. A good way, I think, of showing you that it's about social position uh, is by reading you the conclusions of a study which interviewed people in poverty in very different societies. They interviewed people in poverty in Uganda, in India, in China, Pakistan, Korea, the United Kingdom, and Norway. And poverty in some of those societies means living in conditions like those on the right there. And yet in Norway, living in uh, um, poverty means living in two or three bedroom flat with central heating and probably many of the latest electronics. And yet, um, when they interviewed them about what it meant to them, this is what they say. Respondents universally despised poverty and frequently despised themselves for being poor. Parents were often despised by their children, women despised their menfolk, and some men were reported to take out their self-loathing on their partners and children. Despite generally believing that they had done their best against all odds, they mostly considered that they had both failed themselves by being poor and that others saw them as failures. This internalization of shame was further externally reinforced in the family, the workplace, and in their dealings with officials. Even children couldn't escape this shaming, for with the possible exception of Pakistan, school was an engine of social grading, a place of humiliation for those without the possessions that guaranteed acceptance. And it goes on like this. Uh, and, and what it's really showing us is our evolved sensitivity to social status. You know, think of monkeys in a ranking hierarchy. It's re really important to be further up because uh, the dominants eat first. Uh, the dominant males try and uh, monopolize access to the females. Your chances, uh, uh, both of passing on your genes and of getting enough to eat, are much poorer lower down the social scale. But although that's about poverty, the meaning of poverty, um, you shouldn't think that this is just about poverty. Uh, in a sense, all we're talking about is issues to do with how people are valued. You know, those people feeling they're not valued. Um, and the advertisers know this very well about us, you know, because you're worth it or not worth it, um, whatever. But I mean, 
we all know how sensitive we are to these kind of issues. It's through those sorts of issues that it uh, starts getting, uh, having effects on mental health. Um, I said that it makes issues to do with superiority and inferiority more important. Since we um, first started, well, since our spirit level book came out, um, where we were rather guessing at the causal processes behind the data, um, uh, Richard Leight and Christopher Whelan in, in Dublin have produced this uh, uh, research paper which shows differences in status anxiety up the side. So along the bottom, you've got all the different income groups. This side, you've got the poorest tenth of the population going through to the richest tenth of the population on the far side. And that top line is levels of status anxiety in the more unequal countries. The bottom line is the levels of status anxiety in the more equal countries. So people are more bothered by how they're seen and judged in more unequal countries. Um, and it helps us to understand why mental illness is much more common in more unequal countries. Uh, this is a graph we, we um, produced using World Health Organization data some time ago, which shows there are sort of threefold differences in the frequency of mental illness um, uh, between more and less equal countries. On the, uh, up the side there, you've got the proportion of the population with any mental illness in the previous year. It's not asking you, have you been to your doctor and been uh, diagnosed with depression? Because that would be too easily influenced by how you access medical care in different countries. So the World Health Organization, in order to make it easier to compare mental health from one country to another, um, they used what they call diagnostic interviews on random samples of the population in each country. So you were asked not whether you've been diagnosed with having an anxiety problem or whatever, but about your sleeping patterns, about your feelings of self-worth, about your friendship, about your tiredness, appetite, sense of self-worth, all those kind of things that have been found to be diagnostic. And you see those threefold differences in the proportion of the population mentally ill. We've been enormously helped in understanding that uh, by this paper from Sherry Johnson and her colleagues. She's a psychologist at Berkeley. Uh, she went through a huge literature on mental illnesses and personality disorders, uh, looking for uh, at least three kinds of evidence that these mental illnesses were related to issues to do with dominance and subordination. Um, she describes what she calls the dominance behavioral system, which is an area of our brain uh, which we share. And, I mean, it's in common with other, um, not only primates, but mammals, um, for dealing with issues to do with social position. You know, if you're a subordinate monkey, you must know you're subordinate. You must keep out of the way of, of dominance. Uh, you must behave, you must know everyone's status. Uh, and know where you come and how to behave appropriately. Otherwise, you get beaten up. Um, and apparently, we have areas of the brain that deal with these issues um, uh, for us. But she describes a, a ranges of mental illnesses that seem to be triggered by issues to de um, uh, that involve uh, dominance and subordination. Uh, sorry, uh, yes. And uh, I know the easy way, I suppose, of understanding it is you might accept your inferiority. You might feel hopeless. You might have low self-esteem, regard yourself as, as inferior to everyone. You may, on the other hand, uh, feel that your life is endlessly fighting to stop people putting you down, disrespecting you, and so on. You know, there's some people who, who experience life as a struggle like that all the time. On the other hand, you might just assume um, and never question your superiority to the rest of humanity. 
you know, as I think some of the, the bankers and super rich do, they, they think they deserve these millions because they're so many times better than the rest of us. Um, or you may endlessly be struggling to, to get up. Um, what was interesting, though, was uh, she regarded all societies as having a very similar social hierarchy, a very similar social pyramid. And we got in touch with her and said, actually, we think that ones with bigger income differences, there's a steeper social pyramid, and it triggers the uh, mental illnesses and personality disorders you're talking about more often. Uh, and there's beginning to be evidence that uh, um, those conditions are more common in more unequal societies. Um, and basically, I mean, there seem to be two responses to being more worried about how you're seen and judged. Um, either, you know, you're worried that you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, not funny enough, not pretty enough, whatever it is. You know, young people who... Uh, they're often in tears before going out in the evening, not knowing if they've got the right things to wear, whether they'll know anyone, and so on. Um, but the other response, the other common response, is this sort of narcissistic response. Um, you may know a politician who has some of these characteristics. Uh, so we see that sort of di two divergent responses, both more common in more unequal societies. So there are about three studies saying depression is more common in more unequal societies. This is, uh, these are American states, uh, higher rates of depression in the more unequal ones. Uh, this is something called self-enhancement, which you might see as an expression of narcissism. Uh, so an international team of psychologists asked people in these different countries, um, how do you think you can pair with the average in your country on a number of characteristics? So do you people here think you're more intelligent than most Americans? Do you think you're more attractive? Uh, do you think you're more generous? Uh, you've probably heard the, the joke that 90-something percent of Americans think they're better drivers than average. <laughs> Um, uh, Kate tells me in Sweden the figure is uh, uh, more like 60%. It's still an overestimate, um, but it's not such a big o overestimate. Um, so these people are going through a process uh, we call self-enhancement, bigging themselves up, part of a sort of narcissistic process. Um, and uh, there are some measures of uh, narcissism showing rises over time. This goes from 1975 to 2006. Uh, and, and it looks as if it's doing uh, some rough, roughly what income distribution is doing. There are also uh, uh, research papers showing that schizophrenia is more common in more unequal societies. We did one with Sherry Johnson on psychotic symptoms. They, too, are more common in more unequal societies. So basically what one's seeing is, is the damage that inequality does to social relations that are crucial to our mental health. Um, and the, perhaps the most obvious way we, we self-enhance uh, is through consumerism. Uh, you know, um, trying to make ourselves appear successful and so on, trying to express our status through consumer goods. And there are now a number of studies, both internationally and amongst the 50 American states, showing that if you live in a more unequal area, uh, you're more likely to spend money on a flashy car, you're more likely to search for status goods on the internet, um, particularly clothes with the right uh, fashion labels and so on. All that becomes more important. Um, and consumerism, you have to understand, is not an expression of a sort of innate possessiveness. It's a very alienated attempt to express your self-worth to other people, um, made worse by the status competition exacerbated by inequality. How important those processes are is shown by this graph, again, American data, uh, from 1965 to 2005-ish. Um, you can see 
as inequality goes up, the blue line, debt also goes up. People are borrowing to maintain their position in relation to others. Um, it, it's a good expression of how important issues to do with status are. And you may not think of yourself as status seeking, but what happens is if everyone else is improving their, their standards, you start to think your house and your bathroom, your car, your clothes, all looking a bit shabby, um, second rate. And so, you know, even if you don't think of yourself as a status seeker, you feel these pressures nevertheless. And actually, advertisers have learnt that uh, uh, in more unequal countries, people are more easily manipulated in their purchases. Um, and so uh, they spend more on advertising per head of population in more unequal countries. But when you think of these very high anxiety levels that Kate showed you early on, um, and high levels of depression and, uh, and all that, of course, what we do to, to try and control that anxiety uh, to make meetings with other people less stressful is we use drink and drugs. Um, and uh, we feel a greater need for them in, in those more unequal countries. There are also rises in gambling, in various addictive behaviors, eating for comfort and so on, um, uh, almost certainly behind, behind the higher rates of obesity. I want now, just to, um, before handing back to Kate, to give you a taster of the damage that is done to social relations. There are lots of papers now that show that as income inequality increases, involvement in community life goes down. We have less to do with each other, uh, less likely to belong to civic associations, voluntary groups, less likely to know our neighbors. Um, there are also papers that show just the same thing for trust. We're less likely to feel we can trust other people. There are, uh, there's one paper that shows that people are less uh, likely to help, feel they, they can help others. So less likely to help the aged or the disabled uh, in more unequal societies. So you see the, the sort of reciprocity, involvement in each other uh, declining, uh, but with that, uh, the rise in, in violence. Um, this is a very well-researched relationship all over the world. People have shown that with more inequality, there's more violence. And of course, if you're in a society which pays much more attention to status, then feeling put down, dis disrespected, humiliated, uh, people become particularly sensitive to that. And there's one, it's those sorts of feelings that trigger violence, <coughs> loss of face, humiliation, disrespect. Um, and I think that's really what's behind this graph. The red dots are American states, the blue triangles are Canadian provinces. Again, enormous differences. If you've got about 15 homicides per million um, down there, up to 150. Um, Sometimes people say, this surely isn't just about uh, inequality, it's about ethnic mix. People regard all the violence going on in the poorest communities. Um, and these two researchers, Canadians, Margot Daly and Martin Wilson, uh, to deal with that uh, uh, potential criticism, repeated their analysis, looking just at homicides committed by white people and measuring inequality just amongst the white populations. And the, the relationships are almost unchanged. You have to read the title to the graph to see which you're looking at. It isn't a relationship which is really uh, about uh, something else like race. If you look at really much more unequal countries than Britain or the United States, any of the ones we've been looking at, go to places like uh, Mexico, as we did to give some lectures, you find uh, that people, it's gone a stage further. People are frightened of each other. There are bars on the doors and windows. 
these fences around their yards, the, the wire fencing on top, and just the same in South Africa. I sometimes show a picture there, just the same. And yet the studies of happiness and well-being and health say that the quality of social relationships is absolutely crucial it's to happiness. It's one of the big drivers of happiness. How many friends you've got, the quality of your relationships, whether you're involved in community life, absolutely crucial. And similarly, uh, those things to do with social relations uh, um, are highly protective of health. So you see, inequality is damaging the most crucial factors in, in the quality of our lives, the real subjective quality of life amongst us. I'm going to hand back to Kate now. Our inner level book doesn't just deal with the things we're talking about. It also deals with uh, issues about how uh, people think in, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, that we can't get more equality because we're all nasty, aggressive, competitive individuals. So we show what's wrong with that view. Um, we show what's wrong with the idea that the people have that the social hierarchy is just a hierarchy of ability. Um, a sort of natural expression of uh, differences in IQ. We go through all that kind of stuff, the research and what's wrong with it. Uh, and then we end up by talking about how we need to combine greater equality in order to move towards environmental uh, well-being, uh, um, uh, sustainability, um, and achieve a really higher quality of life for us all. You know, having to deal with carbon emissions doesn't mean lowering the real quality of life. So I want to hand over to Kate. Uh, I've been having warnings that were uh, overrunning. <laughs> time looking at the public health and, and social implications of inequality, but people in other disciplines look at other consequences of inequality, and increasingly economists are turning their attention to how inequality affects um, economic stability. It seems to be crucial for economic stability. You need um, to reduce inequality if you want to tackle poverty, um, and you don't need to have high levels of inequality to get economic growth. In fact, inequality reduces the possibility that you will have economic growth if you want it. Um, Richard mentioned lots of things to do with the environment become more possible, more positive in more unequal societies. But what I sort of want to end with, just before I show you a couple of trends in inequality, is the impact that inequality is having on our democracy. Because when you leave whole sections of your population behind, when people feel excluded or abandoned, um, that they don't have power, that they don't have a voice, that they can't participate, then you really run the risk of your democracy becoming de de fragmented, um, devalued, and you really risk entrenched divisions in society. This graph comes from The Economist, not a publication known for its progressive views, um, but they responded to a challenge. Um, people were asking what factor best explains or is most closely correlated with the swing from Democrats to Republicans in your last presidential election. And the factor that they found best explained that swing to Trump was a measure of health inequality. Um, these are data for all your different counties, more than 3,000 counties in the United States, and they looked at an index of obesity, diabetes, heavy drinking, low physical activity, and low life expectancy. And it was the counties with the worst health that were more likely to swing to Trump. We see exactly the same phenomena in, in the United Kingdom, where it was the um, sections of the population and the geographic areas most left behind, most deprived, most in receipt of support from the European Union financially that voted to leave. 
And so in both cases, we're getting an angry, a disempowered population feeling that the elite, the politicians have left them behind and who are voting in ways that actually are probably, they're voting against their own interests. You know, they're voting for a president who's going to remove their chance of having medical insurance if he can. They're voting for, um, to leave the European Union and not have that um, economic support and risk all of the da damage that will come with it. So inequality is a real danger, a real present, current danger to our democracies and to our abilities to, to be as one as nations. Um, trends in inequality, we saw a decline in inequality from around the 1930s through to about the end of the 1970s, and then a rise in inequality under Reagan here, under Thatcher in the UK, with neoliberal economics. We are now as unequal as we were back then in the 1920s and 1930s. But we used to be more equal, and we can get there again. If we look at the share of incomes in the United States going to the top 1%, that's this red line. It's increased massively. It's increased in Europe as well, but not as much. If we look at the income shares going to the bottom half of the population, they've come down in Western Europe, but they've come down even more in the United States. So these are our, our current trends. Um, we'll stop here, and I know we're going to go to a panel discussion, and I'm sure in that we'll pick up on what we can do about inequality. There are two main ways to reduce your inequality. One is through taxes and benefits, redistributing incomes. The other is to reduce income differences before tax. There are strategies that can help you do that, mostly to do with increasing economic democracy, extending democracy into the workplace. So we'll be happy to have that discussion with you and the panel. Um, thank you for listening. And now I guess we're moving into a more interactive part of the evening. Thanks. As a dean of a school of public health and with declining health status in the United States, something that Richard and Kate didn't talk about, what's the responsibility of schools of public health to A, our declining health status, and B, the role of inequality in producing health? Yeah, so I, we've had many conversations about this within the school. Um, just in the short time that I've been here. And um, I really do think that um, shifting our focus towards um, intervention studies to try and um, identify um, what changes can be made um, to actually reduce those inequalities um, and and pursuing those um, is, to me, sort of that's the next logical step for us. Um, but I, I also wanted to say that, you know, to me, a huge part of it is, is this um, responsibility that we have to start speaking more openly about the core issues related to inequality. Um, and to um, speak truth about those. So to, and it, so I loved the presentation that you guys gave tonight. It was, it was really wonderful. Um, and I just hope that we all continue to sort of have those conversations. To me, um, one of the things that uh, frustrates me the most in the United States is that we continue to um, promulgate what I consider to be a lie, that you know, we teach our children that people in the United States have equal opportunity, and they don't. And um, adhering to that lie um, continues to promulgate those inequalities that we see, but also, I, I firmly believe, and I think you guys have shown, um, causes un undue psychological distress to those individuals by um, suggesting that they are somehow responsible for the missed opportunities that they have. So um, I would love for us within the field of public health to um, take a stand on those issues and, and really 
um, speak about them openly. And I think you've taken a, an important step by revisioning the curriculum for the MPH, so I, I'm really delighted to see that. By the way, that's not me, that's our faculty. Okay. <laughs> they are doing an awesome, awesome job. Uh, Stephen asked me to speak on the subject of how our patients speak about inequality. And I have racked my brain trying to think of a conversation that I had with somebody about inequality at the, at the depth that, that these two researchers have made and the argument they've made. And I can't say that I've had maybe more than two or three conversations at that level. And, and it probably it's because people are just not at that, at that stage in their life when they're capable of that. Because when they come to us at the clinic, I work at CMR, Community Health Centers, by the way, um, they, have, they have some more pressing needs. But the words that they use and the emotions that they express, I think, really tells this story. And so just to give you an idea of who we take care of, we have patients from over 40 different countries. And the two newest countries that I've seen are uh, Guatemala and Cuba. And I ask them, why are you here? How did you come to the US? And in Guatemala, uniformly, they tell me, corruption, delinquencia, they don't care about us. And the Cuban uh, the folks that I've met are all youth. They're probably in their 20s to 40s. And they say, they say Cuba is all about taking uh, care of and co-towing to the tourists if you want to speak out against the inequality in the tourism industry versus the people that are just living day by day, they'll throw you in jail. Or they'll tell you, if you speak out against the government, they'll throw you in jail. And I was really disappointed to hear that because I think very highly of Cuba. I'd been there myself, and it's not my experience when I spoke with the people, but this, this is what they're telling me now. And so just by their presence, people of 40 different countries in our backyard tells you something's not right in the world. I think that's lesson number one. The, the emotions that they display usually begins with anxiety. And Wilkinson and Pickett spoke to this when you have more unequal societies. There's just this anxiety. It's palpable, and, and not everyone is aware that they, that they have that. And it moves to frustration and um, stress. And the words they use, the exact words they use, they will say, well, I just don't have the time. I'll send them to my health educator to try and figure out how they can find a way to eat better or stretch that $5 at the grocery store or get a little more activity in their day. And they say, I just don't have time. I'm working two jobs. I'm working three jobs. I have to take my kids to school. I have to figure out how to juggle daycare, uh, which is the biggest expense in a lot of our patients' households, $2,000 a month sometimes for three of their children for daycare. And they're working two jobs to pay that. Uh, disgust, they will dis uh, express their disgust, and that typically I've seen that emotion from our seniors who find themselves in poverty in a time when they should be living the good life in this country. That's what they were promised by their government. They worked very hard in that, and they lost it in the economic recession. Uh, they express fear. There's a lot of fear out there. Uh, as subtle as a friend of mine who said, you know what, I have a leaky faucet, but I don't complain about that because I have low rent. It can be that subtle up to people saying, I don't leave my house, I pull the blinds, I never answer the door because if I answer the door, they may take me away and separate me from my children. Uh, desperation follows, <coughs> apathy, and loneliness. And my wife continues to tell me that there's an epidemic of loneliness in the world, and that would also speak to the evidence that they've uncovered, which is that people just don't talk with one another anymore. We have um, fences higher and higher between our yards. We have uh, more people communicating by text, you know, limited to a certain number of characters rather than going and having dinner with friends. So what we try to do at the clinic is we, we do a few things. Number one is we give them a door that says Monday through Friday and most Saturdays we're open and we'll see anybody that comes to our door. We'll not, we won't turn anyone away. And we try to be a source of stability for our patients, a source that they can say, you know what, that's a safe space, and if I need help, I can go there, and I can count on that. And that's important to people. Uh, we provide as many resources as we can in the local community to help them deal with the problems that they're having, because we don't have all the answers, but somebody might. Stability, education, if someone doesn't understand their disease or their mental illness or how to even approach the problems they're having, then we work with them uh, in, in a dedicated hour uh, with, with someone that's trained to go through that with them as a life coach. And we try to build community. We have, uh, very proud that we run the Fiestas Patrias celebration in the Seattle area. We've done that now for, I don't know, maybe going on 10 years or so. 
And that's a wonderful way to build community and make people proud of who they are and where they come from. That, and that cannot be understated when people feel pride. And give them hope. I think that's the biggest thing that we learned from the Obama era was hope. Hope really matters. Hope will save lives. Um, and uh, we need to find better ways that we can, we can really instill hope in, in our patients. So that's, that's a little bit about what we try to do to address that. Uh, in some ways, Julian has been uh, a mentor to me, and I, I see our, our work and our lives in, in very parallel ways. Um, and I think there's a, a little bit of a tribute to um, what community-based organizations like the one he works at um, really do when they center the voices of the people they serve. And um, you see that both in the, in the voice and in the words and the actions. And so you would hear similar things from me, so I won't recapitulate all of those. We work also with a very low-income community. 80% um, of the families who come to us are on Medicaid. Um, and I work with uh, kids. Um, so when I was listening, um, I, I went through a few different thoughts in my head and tried to scribble down a couple of them. Um, one is that uh, we've really made intentional changes in our care of uh, health care from this end point of illness and this waiting till you're sick and uh, this highly medicalized model that's been traditional to really a, a social determinist oriented healthcare clinic and, uh, as Seymour has, that you really um, need to do things differently. One of the most important is time. Uh, and closely related to that is um, actually honing a skill of listening, which uh, unfortunately medical school beats right out of you. Uh, in addition, you have to be pragmatic and uh, oriented to service. So um, we and Sumar have a medical legal partnership uh, so that uh, for the challenges that are facing a family every day, the crises that they're facing, knowing that um, the medical model itself is actually inadequate. Um, we uh, work with lawyers, don't we, who uh, in a ways provide better health than anything I could ever do with a stethoscope. We, um, we have a basic needs fund that is not named by, for any particular purpose uh, except what a person names is their important need. And sometimes uh, it's simple and direct and you can understand that uh, a child who sleeps on a floor all night and then goes to school looks like they have ADHD, don't they? Yeah. Um, it's not ADHD, it's a need for a good night's rest. A child that's not eating healthy foods and is worried about where that food is gonna come from um, looks like they have anxiety. Um, and it's the food that they need, not a pill. The ideas of um, not always naming exactly what you're going to do for someone is one of the first foundations of equity, right? <laughs> Uh, that you aren't the person driving and deciding what happens, that it's really the community that you serve, that are the experts, that know what they need and know what to, how to name what they need. And very slowly, by little bits, um, we're still very much stuck in medical model, but we try to be a social determinist-oriented clinic rather than a medical-oriented clinic. And the best work we do are, are our reach workers and our moments of connection and listening and um, appreciation. I had other thoughts about uh, the presentation and it's one that just keeps coming up for me around mental health and poverty and it's just um, something simple that I won't say well and so you can poke any holes in it you want to but it actually makes sense to be highly anxious when you're in a society that you know is not going to serve you well. It's an appropriate response not an inappropriate response and it's interesting to me that sometimes we sort of lay this extra label of, wow, mental health now shows up for you with all of this going on in your life. It would be inappropriate for you to feel completely sane <laughs> when you live in a world where you know, you absolutely know that you and your child's chance to succeed is so, so pushed down and that you see other people around you who have the opportunity to thrive. It's not even, op it's a given. It is a, is a path uh, full of roses that it's a given. You're starting that, that baseball game every day on third base just waiting to head trot towards home. Um, so there's something very appropriate about this connection between mental health and these other conditions. The other thing I was thinking about was, um, you learn a lot that 1975 was this interesting year. Um, okay, I was maybe not very old at that point, but uh, <laughs> what I learned is that there were articles and conversations and meetings and discussions about the end of poverty in 1975. 
There was actually talk about what will our country look like in five years when poverty is gone. Yeah. And it, um, in my mind, it was not just, and I don't mean just in a small way, big capital just, it's not just that, um, that there were investments in economic equality during that time. It was also because there was a robust investment in civil rights, in civil justice, in racial uh, anti-racism activities. And that it makes me think that this conversation about income inequality is so inextricably tied to conversations about racism yeah. and social justice inequality. And that in one way, the income inequality is a, if we think about it upstream all the time, is a slightly downstream component of this bigger issue of social justice, of humanity, of treating other people with kindness and dignity and respect. Yes, right? Yes. <laughs> and, sorry, to your point, we were able to get close to that, so close to that moment, and then we veered very intentionally away from that. I saw an article that said if, uh, if productivity, United States productivity, uh, which has continued to increase really rapidly since the late 70s, if that were matched by the uh, salaries of the people creating that productivity, the uh, minimum wage today would be at least $22 an hour if you matched what people were producing to the income that they should have for that. Um, last two thoughts <laughs> that I had. Uh, one was that the greatest uh, example I saw the other day of your data showing up was um, one of the ways we do equity exercises in groups is this game uh, where we take Monopoly and we have four players. One player plays by the typical rule, one player plays by rules that give them every benefit in the world, automatic property ownership, get $400 when you pass go. This is really tough, I really think you should do this. And then two players have different forms of uh, ways in which they are held down. They pay extra fines, they can't actually own property more than $100. And you watch this game for a couple of rounds and the two in the lowest e income bracket stay in jail. Yeah. The one in the highest uh, income bracket does great, but the interesting thing that proves your point about how it affects everybody at every income level except the highest highest, that person that I will call the middle class who is playing normal monopoly rules is struggling, is barely making it, is really worried, and it's very stressful, and the, the actual depression and s mental health that you see among these players just playing this game is a really powerful thing to watch. So I encourage you to do that if you have groups that uh, have you talked about. You even do this other thing where then you play regular games for, regular rules for everybody. After you've done that for a few rounds, this is the idea, what if, if we just start now and make things equal, everything will be better? No, the game stays the same. The rich people still are the only rich people doing well, and those who are still now playing by regular rules are actually still doing terribly. There's so many lessons to learn in that, and I think that we have to really rethink um, the way we bring these conversations into our lives and how we talk honestly, as you say, about these issues. Sorry if that was long. So, uh, Ben was talking about justice, and as I said, Lynn uh, started this organization, Just Health Action. And uh, when I talked to her about uh, our, our evening tonight, she says, the people I work with in the Duwamish and South Park, they don't really relate to income inequality. Their issues are much more basic. So I, I'd ask Lynn to discuss, you know, is income inequality the kind of concept that flies among marginalized groups? So we run a nonprofit and we have two arms. One does um, kind of research, doc sorry, I'll try to talk louder. You want me to stand up? Okay. Yes. So we have two arms. One we focus on like documenting inequalities and another part is just going into a community and just asking them what their concerns are and how we can be an ally to take action with them. And I don't know if many of you know where the Duwamish Valley is. Do people know? Okay. So it's south of the West Seattle Bridge and it's a highly industrial area but there are Communities that live there, because of redlining, it's mostly low-income minority communities. It's also um, highly contaminated, highly, highly contaminated. And there's a Superfund site, which is like one of the most contaminated um, rivers in the country that flows through that site. And 
the disparities there are pretty, just by the way, I don't know how familiar you are with environmental justice, but it basically means that you're disproportionately exposed to contamination relative to other populations. And so a couple of years ago, we did a, um, a cumulative health impact analysis and we looked at 25 different indicators and you know what we found was that this community is disproportionately exposed. You know they just don't have anything. They don't have tree canopy. They don't have parks. They're a food desert. Um, again, of course, they're exposed to this really high contamination. Um, <clears throat> and they have the heart disease death rate that's two and a half times the rest of the city. They have a 13-year difference in life expectancy from um, wealthier parts of the city. So, and they have the highest childhood asthma hospitalization rates in the city. So. Um, we've been doing this thing called participatory learning and action where we go into the community and find out what their priorities are and we help work on them. And just some examples are they want to be able to take action themselves. So it might be like, well, we want to work on air pollution. How do you want to work on air pollution? Okay, well, let's build some green walls. Green walls are vegetated trellis systems that reduce air pollution. We started an immigrant fisher project, which is this um, project where we found out that Many immigrants are eating contaminated seafood from the Duwamish River, and so we started a Promotorus program. <coughs> Promotorus program is basically like a, a health advocate program where they go out, they learn about the contaminated seafood, and then they talk to their community in their own language in any way that they want to. Um, and then another program that we're working on right now is with the Port of Seattle. The Port of Seattle actually has decided or agreed that they have caused cumulative impacts in the Duwamish Valley, and they want to do something about it, which is amazing. So as Stephen said, OK, I just need you to know, I wrote my thesis on income inequality and health. So when I told him, well, we don't talk about income inequality in the Duwamish Valley, he's like, what are you talking about? Like, how, how could that be? You know, you wrote your thesis on this stuff. And I just wanted to say that even though they don't really talk about income inequality, they talk about equity. And they know that inequalities affect their health. Um, and you know, we've been working on resolutions at the city of Seattle and King County level, environmental equity resolutions, where now the King County and um, city of Seattle are working on um, ex ex you know, changing the community. And, but I did go to some of the people that I work with in the community, and I wanted to ask them, like, you know, what, do you th what do you think about income inequality? And I'm just going to tell you, based on what some of these people said, that is, I said, why don't we think, why don't we talk, why don't you think we talk about income inequality in the valley? That is a stupid question. Income inequality is a question that is asked at the top or at the middle. We focus on the basics in the community, go to the community and find out what the right question is. Is it when CEOs make so much more than the lowest paid worker? I don't know if we really know what it means. The info is not out there. I think explaining the backstory is complex, and then we have to translate it into other, other languages. But we know it's not, right? Why are we talking about income inequality when we should be talking about poverty? People still believe in the bootstrap theory. The thing rich people don't understand about poor people is capacity. Capacity is a serious issue. Capacity means space, needs, time, energy. It's expensive to be poor. Recycling is a luxury. Classism is never discussed. We talk about racism way more, but I think racism was created to support the stratification of classes. When I talk to the same person about instating a Washington income tax, and whether that could be a pathway to reducing income inequality, he was adamantly against it. He could not afford it. Um, we do talk about it. Then someone else said, we do talk about it more than we used to. I see the difference between income inequality and poverty, but I'm more educated, and that is a privilege. In my home, we just talk about poor, middle class, and rich. These academic words, income inequality, are not used in my community. The community does believe that a state income tax would affect, affect them because they don't believe or know that the other taxes will go away. But even though we don't use the terminology income inequality, we know what we want. We want higher paying jobs. We might not be informing the community in the right way, maybe Spanish radio or even Facebook if it's used correctly. And then I actually talked to Puget Sound Sage, which is a really amazing um, 
organization that does policy work on $15 minimum wage and picks it, paid sick leave. And they said, when don't we talk about this? It's the fundamental to what we do. And then they also said, we, we, we don't talk about, we don't use the word income inequality, but we do use the word justices. Racial justice is the focus. We use the word economic justice to be part of racial justice. So my own personal thoughts after working in the Duwamish Valley for 15 years is, I think income inequality and poverty are interchangeable to the people I work with. It's not fair to be for, poor. It's not fair that there's in income inequality. It's not fair that some parts of city have parks and trees and can tree canopy and access to food and low pollution and lower life ex higher life expectancy. Equity is the answer to my community. That's the word they use. And they are getting powerful people like the Port of Seattle and King County to be accountable to them. And that's kind of how they're addressing it. And that's it. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Kate and Richard would respond, and then uh, we would open it up for uh, uh, for audience questions. Would you be able to say a few words? Yeah. Actually, do you want to hold this like that, or yeah? No, no, I'll just hold it. Yeah. Okay. And that's on or not? Okay. okay. Thank, thank you all. I mean, thank you for sharing what you do. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. Thank you for bringing other people's perspectives into this room who, who aren't here to share them with us themselves. The tricky thing is, is that, you know, us um, in our research, we're trying to work towards social justice. You in the school, here, you're trying to work towards it. In your practices, you all are as well. We shouldn't be having to fix these problems. We shouldn't be expecting our doctors to fix the problems caused by social inequality or our teachers to fix those issues. We need to be working on those more fundamental levels so that we don't have to keep on trying to fix the problems that are recreated every generation, all the time, by poverty. You, you asked about interventions, and, and I just want to say something about interventions. In the city where I work um, a lot, in the north of England, it's a city called Bradford. It's very, very poor. Um, and most of the people who live within it are very, very deprived. And we have um, a funder in the UK called the Big Lottery, and they decided they wanted to invest a lot of money in trying to improve the health and well-being of pregnant women and young children. And they have given us, in Bradford, £49 million to do interventions for pregnant women and kids up to the age of three to try and improve child well-being at age five. We've got 10 years to do it, and we've got £49 million. But they put restrictions on what those interventions, sh interventions should be. They are supposed to be interventions um, that change behaviors, like parenting or feeding um, and nutrition and things like that. Now, if you ask me what's the best way to improve the health of this area of Bradford over 10 years with 49 million pounds, I would say work out how many babies are going to be born in that area, divide up the money, and give it to the families. You know. That's, that's the intervention. That's the jobs we want, the stability so that we're not anxious, so that, so that we, we're well paid, so that we're not having to work harder, be cleverer, be better organized than rich people because we have to do so much more with less. It's incomes that people need. It's their livelihoods that need to be improved. We need to lift that income floor at the bottom and that means we need to do something about lowering those runaway incomes, salaries, bonuses, wealth accumulation and extraction at the top. So it isn't just about poverty, although it is a lot about poverty. It is also about the elite and the powerful and the vested interests and those incomes at the top. We were just watching someone speak at the World Economic Forum in Davos. We weren't there. <laughs> We've never been invited to go and talk about inequality at Davos. Um, but 
some other impressive people have, and we were watching somebody stand up there and call them out on the fact that, how many was it, 15 100 private planes had arrived in Davos to hear talks about climate change. <laughs> and also, nobody was talking about taxes. And the man who raised this issue, he said he felt like he was at a fireman's convention where nobody was allowed to talk about water. So we do need to talk about health care and how we work in communities and organizing, but we really, really need to talk about taxes. I have very little to add, um, except I think the way in which people are most aware of what we are, in a way, talking about uh, triggered by income inequality, made worse by inequality, is those issues to do with respect. Um, I mean, it's so clear that the very well-established tendency for violence to become more common with more inequality is because people are sensitive to humiliation, loss of face, disrespect, all those kinds of things. And uh, I'm, for a long time, I worried that uh, when people asked uh, studies of who people compared themselves with, people always said, people like ourselves. You know, it looks as if it's people comparing themselves not with the rich or the poor, but with people in their neighborhoods, uh, um, people like them. Uh, but actually, I, I'm, I'm struggling because uh, I, I, I'm often told I talk too much about monkeys. Uh, <laughs> but uh, actually, to understand these relationships, you have to understand uh, monkeys more than you have to understand Marx. You see, Robert Sapolsky, who goes out to the Serengeti every year to study baboons in the hierarchy, he says, number seven baboon never fights one, two, and three. He knows he's lose. And uh, he, he never fights numbers 14, 15, 16, because they know they would lose. He watches the uh, number seven watches six and eight. I risk losing my status when you start treating yourself and talking about me as if you think you're better than me. So I say, who the hell do you think you are? And if you go on doing it to me, you know, that's, you get towards violence. That is the way people recognize inequality. Um, and it's why I call inequality a social relationship. It's those invidious social comparisons that are exacerbated. And of course, um, we can't stop ourselves judging personal worth and ability from status and so on. We can try and say, okay, I'm nice, I'm willing to sort of try not to do that and treat everyone politely. But as a society, you can't expect all that to melt away. It's such a strong thing. What you've got to do is reduce the income differences, which make all that so much more apparent. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that um, the importance of talking about inequality rather than poverty is I think that we've shown that it's not a matter simply of being nice on behalf of a, a poor minority. It's not a matter of trying to get people to be altruistic. I think that what the data shows uh, from quite a number of studies now, when we say the effects go all the way up, that a more egalitarian society is better not just for the poor, but for the vast majority of them. We are fighting for a better society for ourselves as well as other people. It's about the quality of life, the real quality of life, that has so much to do with how we get on with each other. Um, and of course, people committed themselves to major change in the past, you know, in the socialist movement, um, because they thought 
I suppose they thought that Marxism actually was a, a, the program to how to create a society better for all of us. We know what went wrong with that. We now face the threat of climate change, which if we don't react is going to make life a lot worse for all of us. And in relation to that and our growing understanding of the effects of inequality, uh, we have to develop and communicate and inspire the idea that it is possible to get a society better for all of us. I think that's crucial. All right, let's see. So, um, I mean, we have some comments from people in the audience. There are two microphones up here. Uh, please uh, come up to come up and uh, let me make sure that they're turned on. Go ahead. Interventions is really, um, I think I'd be more supportive of that if they were more advocacy related to income tax. If, like, public, the School of Public Health actually translated some of the studies that we know that affect health into our legislative body. But in the absence of that, if we are going to move towards interventions as our primary goal, I think the quality and the tenor of those studies and those conversations would be greatly improved if our student body and our faculty reflected the actual ethnic and demographic diversity of our community. And so I would just like to hear sort of what your strategies are for making our student population and our faculty look more like our community. Yeah, so I agree with you 100%. Um, and those are huge challenges. So what are we doing? So I, I guess I would point it as a success story um, so far to um, the Department of Health Services, which has um, made a deep commitment to increasing diversity during hiring, um, and also to the way that they approach um, recruiting and admitting students. Um, so the way that they have done that has been um, to embrace what's called holistic admissions. So uh, actually looking at um, prospective students and faculty applicants as complete human beings, as opposed to looking just at numbers, like grades, uh, so not just GPA, GRE scores. Um, which can often be a marker of privilege as opposed to a marker of um, potential or excellence. Um, and they have um, embraced also, I think fairly deeply, the idea that they really need to have open conversations about uh, the processes that we use to uh, recruit faculty. Um, so as a result, um, they've seen a dramatic increase in the diversity of their faculty within the department over the last five years. Um, and it, I think it's an inspiration for the rest of us. Um, we're, so we're trying to disseminate those best practices, um, both for student recruiting and for faculty recruiting. So for student recruiting, um, we're having the conversation across the departments about um, not just that we need to be using holistic admissions, but what does that mean? How do we do that in practice? Um, and then also um, for the faculty searches, um, meeting with each of the faculty search committees to talk about what do best practices in searches actually look like. Um, but I have to tell you, I don't think that's the entire solution. So 
Um, there are other factors that are more challenging that have to do with the way that we support students and faculty. So um, coming from UCLA, um, one of the interventions that, that we used there um, that made a huge difference was dedicating funding specifically for students um, who came from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. And so by, by doing that, we dramatically increased um, the percentage of students who were former Pell Grant recipients who came to our school. Um, and we also dramatically decreased the, the debt burden of our students coming out. Um, and so those are things that I would like to see us doing more here. Um, the way that the dean at the um, School of Public Health at UCLA did that was by actually going out and bringing in new funding that was specifically for that. Um, and so that is a challenge to me personally. Um, in terms of the faculty support, um, the way that we have been supporting our faculty within the school, um, I truly believe does not um, support creating a more diverse faculty um, because we have a system where faculty are expected to bring in resources to support themselves. And, um, and don't provide a lot of funding up front for new faculty. Um, and that uh, reinforces hiring more faculty who look like the faculty that we already have. It does not support the creation of a diverse faculty. So um, those are things that we are talking about across the school, about how do we change the paradigm for how we support students. It's something that we're talking about across the institution. Um, but I don't have for you an easy fix for that, um, other than to say that I am personally deeply committed to making those changes happen, um, and that I see that there is a strong commitment on the part of a significant number of our faculty to make those changes happen, um, and that we're going to continue working on them. But I. I, I wish I could tell you that I had like an instant fix for those. Um, they're changes that are going to take time. Um, but I, I do think we have some good paths forward. As a naked ape, I want to say that you <laughs> don't talk too much about monkeys. <laughs> Please continue. And. Um, I don't know if this is a fair question or not. I think it's important, though. Um, I think my question is uh, one about popular culture and uh, beyond, uh, beyond the academy. Um, getting your message to be more mainstream. Uh, there are uh, people that uh, we're all familiar with that pander uh, to our uh, more primitive uh, aspects of human nature. Uh, you, you might uh, include Margaret Thatcher in that list, um, Anne Rand, uh, Ronald Reagan, and a favorite, Rush Limbaugh. Uh, I would like to uh, just hear some comments about that, please, from anyone. media that is dominated by the right and the elite. And the messages that um, get promulgated throughout society about poor people, um, people who are not successful, people who are migrants to our country, people who don't fit in in some particular ways, those narratives are strongly determined um, by the, by the media. The fake news terminology is quite new, but fake news has been around for a long time about what it means to be poor in an unequal society and what it means to not be successful and not be part of the elite. I think and many of us hope that with social media and more democratic access 
to, to, to media, that we might see a shift in the conversation. Um, and sometimes social media has been a force for good. I'm going to ask. But so often it hasn't been, and it's simply become another way in which the voices of the angry are, are, are amplified. I don't know how we counteract that. You know, we, we need positive stories. We had some stories brought, brought to us tonight. And the stories of the people um, that we need to hear, we don't, we don't hear often enough. And those are stories of, of hard work and opportunity. Um, and I, I don't know how we, we find ways to amplify those stories and mix them in with our statistical evidence so that we have a rich narrative that is both evidence-based um, and informed by lived experience. But we, we need to find ways to do that, to counteract those dominant narratives. So we have uh, five other people who want to ask a question. or uh, And so can you come up and just e state your question rather quickly, and then we'll see if Richard and Kate and the panel can address it. So just sure. all five and <laughs> All five in sequence. All right, I'll try and go quick. Um, so I believe the system's designed to keep you down. I have clients every day that they might get a 25 cent raise, which equals out to $500 roughly, if they're full time, then they lose their benefits. But the amount of benefits that they're losing comes nowhere close to the amount that their raise was. So my main question, I work for a nonprofit on the east side. Our charge is <coughs> getting people out of poverty, we help them with food, energy assistance, financial assistance, among other things. What more can we do to impact our clients' lives more yeah. long-lasting as opposed to, here's some food, here's a check, here's help with your energy bill? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Laura. I lead a project called the Happiness Alliance where we're providing tools and resources all over the world now. And some of the resources are, this is how you can make change. So what blows me away about the US is that our marginal tax rate in the 50s and 60s was 90, right? How are we gonna get there? And how can we transmit that to communities and to, and to people who are active? So, um, and that's what I, I would like to hear, is like, what are the action steps to get there? Hi, I'm Charles Mayer, I'm a family doc, and I work on equity at where I work. Um, I think um, what you guys have been saying is, is, one, is great, and that racism is a construct um, that uh, does serve certain people in society, and it doesn't serve others clearly. But I wanted to bring up racism I, again, because I think our country is specifically a problem with um, the attempt to genocide Native Americans, 400 years of oppression of African Americans, it plays a special role in this country. And I'm wondering how we address that historically so we can move on and actually address these questions more fundamentally. Okay. Thank you all for thought inducing. In coming to Ms. Pickett about should need to be doing, and Dr. Danielson about anxiety response to society we know not functioning well, I would appreciate your comments on, as healthcare professionals or community organizers, to you falls the responsibility with the abdication of leadership since 1975 or 1980s. Can you restate that? I'm sorry. Say again? That last part I didn't quite, can you restate that question? Just the last as part. abdication of leadership, I think. Do you fall? I'm sorry. As healthcare professionals or community organizers, oh, let's see if I got this. With the abdication of leadership since 1975 or the 1980s, as healthcare professionals or community organizers, to you falls the responsibility. Ah. Hey, last two. I think we have kind of similar questions, but essentially um, when it comes to fighting in income inequality, many of the narratives that were fed uh, deal with the neoliberal um, 
framework that it's just about working harder. I think one of these examples is uh, the, the trade school myth that we just need to send more people to doing trades. That's the solution, which it's not. Um, how do we fight the narrative, th those narratives, and say it really is about marginal, um, marginal tax rate increases, et cetera? What, would, what are your suggestions on how to really get to the root of uh, the progressive solutions that are needed? Um, I was, I think one of my personal fixations is on individualism. I feel like because it's the foundation of our country, because people believe I got here on my own, that's why they can't hear about racism, they can't hear about inequality because I did this on my own and sort of what's embedded in our country. So I think I was obsessed with trying to, how do I get people to change their individualistic framework? But I think I'm hearing a different way to approach it is just to understand that the individualism exists and say that this helps everybody. I just kind of wanted to clarify, do you see telling everyone this affects you too, maybe long term to kind of change that individualism idea or kind of where does that fit in? Thank you. So, simple <laughs> questions. Uh, the panelists and uh, the, our speakers have about a minute each to reply to them. <laughs> It's working, okay. Uh, look, I'm just gonna take a lesson from Mexico. So Mexico is a country that went through a very violent bloody revolution in 1910. And many of our patients still remember because their grandparents told them stories about that time. They remember the stories, they remember the lessons. In this country, people don't remember the stories and the lessons because our revolution was long, long time ago. But these folks in Latin America, Central America as well, they've been through civil wars as recently as the 1960s. They, this is very, very burned in their mind. They know the injustices. They know how they had to rise up. They know how they were squashed, and they know how they, ha how they had to escape. But in Mexico, they have gone through a cycle where my grandfather told me that the rich people could walk through the streets with money hanging out of their pockets at 2 in the morning, and they didn't have to worry about a thing. And that is uh, just a perfect encapsulation of what you know, inequality is. And that is where we're going today. And people in America don't know their history, they don't study history of other places, they don't travel around outside of the country as often as they need to, or talk with people of other places. You can learn a lot from other people and we don't have to make those same mistakes. And so when we're talking about pop culture and how to change people's minds, we need to find ways that we can get people to, to talk with folks in, in other parts of the world. I think social media should have been the answer to that, but there, 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 there's a failure there. And I cannot put my finger on that, but there's a failure there some way. And who, who's, who needs to fix that? Well, it's the people that run social media. Um, I wanted to add a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, sort of making change happen. And one I would add just to uh, the question of, of adequate representation of students and faculty, um, and it has to do with us. If we vote for things like Initiative 1000, we will crush that horrible thing called Initiative 200 from 1999 that made it very difficult to actually have uh, social and race conscious hiring and admissions practices. We have things that we can do that are actually very, very important. If I think of the one thing that would be the most impactful, I think about that. I think about, okay, I'm gonna say 1975 again. One of my mentors was, uh, is a doctor who retired recently and when he got at some award once, he stood up and he said, 1975, I'm so proud of graduating from that time because it was the most diverse that the University of Washington School of Medicine has ever been and it's never been anywhere near that since then. That's striking to me. Uh, we had policies then that talked about ensuring that we created a more diverse and representative society. If we are willing as a, as a state to vote in an income tax, these are on the, on the legislative uh, um, palette just about every legislative session. We are the ones that don't vote for those things. And I'm not trying to say this is only about our responsibility, but I am trying to say we have more agency than sometimes people whose interest it is for us to think we can't do things um, stay silent. Our quiet complicity is something that we have to think honestly about. I just have one question for everyone, and that is, as you know, I, I work in an, uh, this nonprofit that tries to take action in low-income minority communities on the things that they prioritize. 
should I be working on income inequality in a different way? Have I been asking or doing it incorrectly? Because I'm that's what I've been thinking about this whole time is how do I talk about it with these communities? So my take home lesson from today, and I don't think the answer to your to what you're asking is Yes, <laughs> but, but I, let, I defer to others who know more. I, I, to me, the biggest take home lesson of today has been that we as a school need to be working more closely with people in the school of public policy, with people in the law school to train our students to actually take action, right? Um, and I, and, I, and I know Stephen said he was excited about our, our, um, our new re-envisioned MPH core, but I, I'm gonna go back and look and see to what extent that's reflected in, in that core. Although I feel like I keep going back to them and saying, have you done this, have you done, what about that? Um, but thinking about how we re-infuse that into our curriculum and how we do that cross-fertilization across the disciplines. Yeah. I'll just say something about um, process because there's not enough time to address some of the sort of specific questions and I, I think the first thing we have to do is we, we have to share knowledge with one another, we have to educate one another, um, we have to bust those myths that people hold about others and about what inequality means and who's worthy and who's not. And there's no privileged knowledge there. Everybody's knowledge is relevant. Everybody has something to share and to learn. So as people sort of start to understand the impact of inequality on their lives, and it doesn't matter if they call it inequality or not, as long as they, you know, as people start to understand it, then we need to come together because it's our solidarity that we need, right? It's, it's acting together. And we were at a community event in another state um, a couple of days ago, and someone said, they have the power, but we have the people. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to remember. We are the people who can make change happen when we act in solidarity, when we act together. But the acting is important. And the other thing that someone said at that other meeting was, do not act alone. You know, Don't go away and just act on the internet. Act in active relationships with one another, and that's how we will create change. Um, <clears throat> I was going to say that uh, in our book we deal with uh, the fact that skin color is not an indication of all sorts of other genetic differences that people take it to be evidence now that's only in the last 10,000 years that Europeans have become white rather than black as they were when they came out of Africa. Um, but actually, I'm reminded, I, I, we also deal with the stuff that makes people think that the social hierarchy is a reflection of genetic differences in ability. We go into the detailed research on those things and show what we learn from brain scans uh, uh, and so on about our modern knowledge of the malleability of the human brain that shows it all false. But, 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 I don't think it's statistics, books, um, words like this that changes anything. I'm reminded of uh, uh, James Scott um, talking about the New Deal under Roosevelt. He said it wasn't the statistics on unemployment and so on that changed anything. It was the wildcat strikes, the riots, uh, that put the fear of God into them, he said. Uh, at least he said that was quoting his mother who said that. Um, and of course, Roosevelt himself talked about uh, we must reform in order to preserve. Um, and of course, you know, we don't need to be convinced of the, 
the unimportance of things like skin color or other markers of, uh, of class differences like um, um, what language you speak in some countries or what religious group you belong to. Uh, what matters is actually getting to know each other. The places that uh, uh, voted most right-wing had the most racist votes in Britain were the places with the smallest immigrant populations. Um, uh, and I think that um, I'm, I'm reminded of how invigorating people find the self-efficacy even of, of going on strike. I saw something about a, a woman who joined a small strike against McDonald's. She said that day of taking action was the best day of her life. Um, when people start to feel they can be effective with other people, that's so crucial. Could I just say something really quickly? Uh, go ahead, just go. Turn around and go. Oh, you know, I just wanted to ask um, and to say thank you. This was so powerful and meaningful and inspirational. And that information is power. Um, and this is a room full of people who are already very caring and concerned um, and aware. But if we could get those slides that were at the very beginning, somehow the way that we can share with people other people in our lives to get those ripples out there of awareness, that would be really helpful. Okay. So I just, so we, if you registered, I think we have your contact information and, and uh, send it out. Uh, one thing that you might want to do together, this is on, no it's not. Uh, WPSR, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, also helped organize and sponsor this, and they had a table outside, and we have an economic inequity health task force. And so one of the things that we're, so we're working on these issues, uh, if they're still out there and you can sign up uh, for interest, then uh, please do. So I want to take this time to thank Richard and Kate and our panelists. I think we've had a great